You're welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Art and culture is one aspect of the creative space that helps us express our ideas and experiences. Art, expression of our thoughts, emotions, intuitions, and desires. But it is even more personal than that. It's about sharing the way we experience the world, which for many is an extension of personality. One person that has done this effortlessly is Poli Alakija, an experienced creative director in the arts, culture, education, and social development with over 30 years of demonstrable achievements of project execution and leadership. She joins us on the show this morning as we discuss her works, how she's been able to successfully engage with multifaceted stakeholders and government institutions in the United Kingdom, Nigeria, and South Africa. With her team at the Five Cowries Arts Education Initiative, Polly designs and develops sustainable empowerment programs in partnership with key stakeholders and creatives, creating impactful programs in the most undeserved, hard to reach communities. Good morning, Polly. Morning, Good to have you join us in the studio today. Good morning. I mean, good morning. Thank you for joining us. It's been a while. How have I you know. been? You know, I'm struggling good. between Abuja and UK and Lagos and everywhere. You All good? is well. All is well, thank you. Lovely to be here. <laughs> Thanks right, for having me. Ah, thank you. Let's talk about your latest project, you know, uh, and I know that uh, it's coming to an end. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the morals painting, the, uh, basically the street art projects around uh, Bambushe and some part of Lagos Island. Tell us about it. What uh, informed this three-part, three-week thing and how, how's it coming up? Nice one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm calling this project Potopoto, Potto, which in Yoruba means swamp. So just that very name in itself Potto. is <laughs> your <laughs> better pronunciation. Just the very name has caused a bit of discussion. And I'm probably why are you doing this? You know, and a lot of people see that word as something a bit negative and saying, no, mm. you know, I'm talking about climate change. I'm talking about biodiversity. We need to celebrate Mother Nature. Right mm. now, pre-COVID, I was going to do um, a mural arts program on Marina and we were going to be talking about climate change and the fact that Lagos is a city under threat because of the rising sea levels. Of course, COVID came along and literally washed that program out. And so I still wanted to talk about um, climate change and how it, it could affect a city like Lagos. But rather than now talking about rising sea levels, we're now talking about a deluge. Mother Nature is now really angry. So what would that mural look like? At the same time, I'm kind of experimenting a bit because um, I'm getting a bit concerned about narratives around public art, that it's starting to look a bit like an extension of a museum and gallery, but on the street. It is not that. It's about an ongoing dialogue. It has to be interactive. So what I'm really doing is kind of just experimenting. Can we make that public arts process an experience and more directly engaging. And so then I thought, well, what if the actual mural itself evolves over time? So rather than heading for a finite output, like this is the end piece, have it evolve, document it, and use the content from the documentation. So it doesn't really end tomorrow. From tomorrow onwards, we now springboard off it, the conversations that have come out of it, and take it forward from there. So, yeah. I, I think it's such an important conversation, climate change as well. How did you get permission to be able to um, do the murals on that particular area? And why did you choose that area? Nice one. Um, why that particular area? Lagos Island is the heart of Lagos, right? We all know that. And over the years, every time I visit Lagos Island, it increasingly is evident it's um, an environment that's under threat for various reasons, um, not only um, the pressure of the population. And if you look at the history of Lagos Island and um, the architecture of Lagos Island, once upon a time, Bamboche Street was one Brazilian style building after another. Yeah. Now, every time I visit, yeah. particularly Bamboche Street, more and more of those old buildings have been removed quite naturally and replaced with taller buildings that accommodate 10 times more people. So. 
I've always been interested, right, in how can we shine a spotlight on that issue. It is an issue. Um, I think a lot of us in arts and culture would like to see these old buildings preserved, yeah. our heritage preserved. But then how does that fit within a community that has very practical needs? How do we house everybody in these old small buildings that are not practicable anymore? That's not really my personal narrative, but what I can do with this project is, right, let's shine a spotlight on that for those who, who, for which it is a, a major concern, to pick up the baton and start that conversation. And that's actually happened quite a lot over the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Um, now, how I got permission, not an easy story. It's always difficult, as you know, Steve, <laughs> getting permission to paint in the public space. Public space is that. It is a public space. Yes. It belongs to the public. But this is a private property. But it's public facing. Um, so my team negotiated, met the residents, met the family. The family have been absolutely wonderfully supportive. And indeed, because the project's gone so well and been accepted by the local community so well, um, the family who owned the building and other community members now want their buildings to have a similar project happen to them. So it's always tricky getting permission to do these programs. Um, but the family have been fantastically supportive. Mm. So let's see what happens next. So where are you taking this project to next? Oh, interesting. Um, there's various stakeholders that I'm talking to. Um, for a while, I've been looking at putting together a consortium of stakeholders to support a public arts program that can be used to empower young people, transfer the skills to young people, put in the structures so that questions like how to get permission to do this, mm -hmm. a part and parcel of that, and also yeah. some seed funding. Yeah. So whilst this is very much a poly-driven project, yeah. it's hopefully going to segue into a broader program that will support young artists. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is a poly-driven project, uh, but then is it also a poly-funded project? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you well, know, now that you you have you know more requests, you know, to do the similar things to you know other houses, is this something yeah. that can you know conveniently come out of your pocket? <laughs> well, as you know, again, public arts is always something that there's zero financial sense behind mm. this, right? So it's something that's absolutely done from a point of passion. Um, programs like this, I mean, I'm blessed with good friends and supporters who merrily buy into the polyvision um, and help make these things happen. Um, and these things need to be forced to happen. It's yeah. a catalyst for other things. So I'm in itself, no, poly is taking time out and with my friends and supporters, doing what it takes to make this happen okay. um, so that we can then use the content, use the story, use the attention it's created mm. to springboard onto, right, yes, now we need to set up a fund for public arts yeah. um, and take it forward from there. So okay. at a certain point, you have to dive in and make it happen. Mm. And how is that going, setting up that fund? I understand that you're also a connector. You're not just, you know, um, yeah. poly. You've been working with government institutions in the UK, That's South right. Africa, and Nigeria. That's Talk right. to us about that life of influence. Well, what's been great about that is just visitors that I've had to Bamboshi Street. Mm. And I mean, again, the community is so accepting because I've had all sorts of visitors to Bamboshi Street and nobody on the street bats Eyelid. I mean, I've had dip diplomats, um, commissioners, everybody's been there, popped by, seen what's going on. And, you know, when you're around a table putting forward a presentation and here's another proposal, here's another budget, ugh, I can understand, oh, here we go again. It's really hard to get their attention. But when these key stakeholders in a position of making a decision come to sight and see it actually happen. Right, now we've got their attention. Now we can talk. So yes, they, they will all be getting calls from, from me in the next few <laughs> weeks. <laughs> all right, I mean, let, let, me, let me talk at somebody who's interested in subject matters like this. Um, if uh, I'm around that area, or let's say in front of uh, that particular building in uh, on Bangbushe Street, two things will strike me. Uh, first will be to uh, what, 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 you know, uh, informed your interest uh, in terms of heritage preservation. Mm. You know, that would be a key uh, a consideration for me. And I'd like to ask you, do you think that this can lead to um, um, galvanizing the government uh, to take uh, the idea of heritage preservation more seriously, mm. uh, especially as it concerns uh, those Brazilian, old mm. Brazilian type of architecture uh, from Lagos Island to Yaba, etc. That's one. The second part will be, how long uh, does it take you, on the average, you and your team, you know, to put all the resources together, all the materials, and then turn the, 
you know, the facade of, of, of that structure into something that, you know, that will engage people and you want to stay and just appreciate it. How long does it take, you know, and what is required to make that mm. transformation? Okay, nice. Um, gosh, will this help us galvanize that narrative mm. with um, public sector stakeholders? You know more than me about that, Steve. <laughs> um, I certainly hope so. But it's, it's a difficult one and it's a challenge. It's a global challenge, isn't it? When you yeah. look at culture and heritage and, you know, look at who we are right now. Yeah. There's so much incredible cultural heritage everywhere and the world pressures, financial pressures are, are humongous and yeah. we're all having to tighten our belts. So how, how do we now find the money to, mm -hmm. to preserve these old buildings? It takes a lot of money um, and it's not only here, it's, it's around the world. Um, is that totally a public sector responsibility it's a tough one <laughs> yeah. um and you know look at arts councils and funders of arts and culture around the world Every, i don't think anybody's really solved that problem um and especially in a society like ours where i mean just let's look at bamboshi street Let, yeah. let's look at the infrastructure needs on bamboshi streets now if you had a substantial amount of money to spend on that street yeah would it be to preserve these old buildings that might not be deemed fit for purpose? Mm. Or would it actually be to sort out the infrastructure, the drains, the pavements, the lights, mm -hmm. um, the schools in the neighborhood? Where would you put your money? Now, it's all too easy for somebody, especially from my clearly Western perspective, to look at these old buildings and to be swayed by, in a romantic way, by the history and their story. And they're beautiful to look at aesthetically, right? We mm -hmm. want to preserve them. Um, it's all too easy to be swayed by that, but what is a practical need right here and now for the community? I don't know. It's not for me to come up with the <laughs> solutions, but I think what I can do is help shine a spotlight on that yeah. narrative and say, right, this is the situation. Let's get the documentation. Let's collect the data. Where actually are these buildings and what is happening? Yeah. Just on Bamboche Street, I would say, like I said, in the last year, several more buildings have disappeared. There's some that are beautifully preserved, but four or five um, on a street that would have been entirely back-to-back -back Brazilian houses. There's quite a few that you can see behind um, corrugated iron hoardings that you can see in a process of being demolished. And you can see as they're demolished, you can see the very fabric of the buildings. It's, they're built from ballast bricks. So, you mm -hmm. know, even within that, there's a story. So, I mean, for me, I'm very concerned that these heritages are being lost without us documenting it, mm -hmm. without us holding on to that knowledge yeah. and the history. So when I'm standing there, and yesterday I had some visitors, and we were pointing out one building that was in the process of being demolished. And I said, look, you can see that it's built from ballast bricks. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, yeah, if you do, <laughs> if you do an analysis of those bricks, you probably find they come from Liverpool or Wales, yeah. right? And that's, those bricks were then used to build this building built by a Brazilian returnee family. These are fascinating stories, and that, who's documenting that? Who's holding on to that culture mm -hmm. and heritage? So there's the history and documenting yeah. of the history, yeah. also then disseminating it and educating children and young people about that history. How do you do that? So it's the history, documenting it, the education, and then we've also got the structures. Mm -hmm. Now what do we do with that? I mean, as you know, in many cities around the world, when they've got the money to do this, they would um, preserve the facade, maintain the facade and then behind that up goes the 10 story building. So at least the facade is protected. Yeah. You see that everywhere, but that is a very expensive Would approach. Would that be recommended here, for example? I think that might be a solution, but as I said, that that's, <laughs> doesn't come cheaply. Um, and yeah, so where does that money then come from? Are you going to say to the families, yes, you can develop your property and put up 10 floors, but you have to prevent preserve the facade yeah. and this is how you're going to go about it and this is the cost. I believe that I can, yeah. I, well, I think if I was them, I would, I would then say, I think I'm going to sell the property. I don't think I can afford this. You know Steve is an artist, so talking about that as well, so he's more yeah. inclined to think yeah. in that direction. But um, Polly, I'd like to ask, I mean, what informs your decision and the type of image that you use for your murals as well and you know the type of message that you want to uh, share to the public and I understand that you've been here for over 30 years yes. you've been in Nigeria talking about shining the spotlight on the art how has uh, that grown from the time that you've been here to now and also I believe that there is also the exhibition going on 
right now the Art X. Are you yes. part of that as well? You know, I know I asked you a lot of questions, but we can start from, <laughs> you know. I didn't the finish decision. answering your questions, Steve, so I need to keep reminding yeah. you what the yeah. questions are. Yeah. So I'm not part of Artex this yeah. year, but of course I'm loving watching what's happening what's with Artex and the catalytic um, effect of investing in something in arts and culture. It's incredible, the ecosystem that develops around it, and also, of course, mm -hmm. the footfall and the boost to the economy, the local economy that just that one art event has had is, mm -hmm. is incredible. Um, yes, and like, how do I inform my imagery? Well, it kind of just comes organically and naturally, but I'm always very mindful that even though I am now a Nigerian citizen, I wasn't for many years. I'm, I came as a visitor and Nigeria, I'm very, I remain very blessed and very grateful that Nigeria has become my home and I've been welcomed so much and so warmly. But um, so I'm very mindful of my role and my responsibility. And I do feel I do have a responsibility to my audience. Um, you know, if if I just want to paint still lives or portraits, I'll probably just stay back in the UK and get on with it. But I'm here, and if I can use my art mm. to influence, to open eyes, to educate, I do feel, that's my approach, I do feel I have a responsibility mm. to use that audience. If I've created an audience, if I have a following, if I have people who follow my work because they love it or they hate it, what can I use that audience? That, that access to audience for. And so I do look at that intersection between arts, culture, and social development. So what is the issue of the day? And for me, the overarching issue of today is climate change, biodiversity, and the environment, and also what it means in here, to communities here. I, I wouldn't on Bamboche Street start talking about the responsibilities of climate change, yeah. but what we can talk about is what you can do as an individual to protect your environment. And what does that mean to you? Right. Yeah. The, the, the second part of the question that I asked was, how, how long uh, did it take you, or will it take you normally to transform the facade of, of a building, like the one you did on Bangboshe? Yeah, thank you. So. Um, Luckily, it's a little small building, and I purposefully selected a small building. We don't need scaffolding. So in terms of doing quite exper experimental approach to doing the mural is quite easy. So I don't need scaffolding. Um, we're quite light on our feet. Um, so the preparation, maybe about two months, um, working into the imagery. So before you get to site, you need to know exactly what your visual language is. Yeah. It needs to be like totally second nature. So there's a good couple of months of prepar preparatory drawing, sketches, getting into the narrative, which is one thing in the studio then changes when you're on site, of course. So I say two months of preparation, a week of practical prep preparation, getting the equipment together, making sure your team is ready. And then the actual execution on the building. Now, if I was just going to do one image on a relatively small building like that, a week. But as you know, this time we've been telling a narrative. So each couple of days that image has changed. So if you, you go there today, it's a very different image to what you would have seen a week ago. So kind of keep changing the image, keep changing the image. Now, because there's been so much interest on Bamboshi Street for having murals on buildings, yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to like, select like 10, 20 buildings along the street and have different <laughs> artists like, do their murals on those buildings? And then I would say each artist, right, you've got two weeks to do your mm. mural, and that should be adequate. But they would need a lot of training because a lot of artists think, oh, you know, let me just pitch up on site and get painting. No, you've got to know your language very well before you get to site. Mm. It needs to become second nature to you. So when you're on site, you can just get on with it. Mm. All right. As we prepare to um, um, end the interview, I'd like you to talk about the, is this like the second leg of what uh, a lot of people um, uh, recognize that you did very well in Lagos a few years ago, as far as public art is concerned. You know, the, uh, the transformation of the underbridges, particularly Falomo mm. and stuff. Is that something that you miss? Is that something that you think should have continued? I mean, uh, 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 because that was almost something akin to a renaissance at the time, you know, uh, in terms of the attention given to uh, uh, a public art and streets. Mm -hmm engagement. Absolutely. And you know that you played a key role in that, right? So um, you were very much part of that <laughs> movement as it was. And do I see this as step two? Absolutely. Um, 
Public art is always difficult, as you know. Yeah. Everywhere around the world, it tends to be controversial. So there's always some pushback. So I think we would have liked to have seen an immediate sort of momentum from yeah. what we did like 10 years ago. But public art around the world, it doesn't work out like that. It takes a while. And, but I do feel there's a slight shift in attitude now. And also shift in attitude around the narratives we can talk about in the public space. I think yeah. now people are a little bit more open to write, okay, maybe we can start having images in the public space that speak to social development. Whereas I think 10 years ago, as you know, people would have been a mm, little bit mindful of it. So I do think there's a bit of a shift. And I do think there's a lot of talk about, okay, should that happen in Abuja? Should it happen in Lagos? Personally, I think it should happen in both places. Absolutely. Um, so yes, it is step two. And yeah, make sure you're still part of step two, <laughs> even though you stepped away from the role you had previously. Well, All right. you've done really well, and I've seen that you've done exhibitions in, you know, different countries, and, you know, I hope that I get to visit one of your exhibitions soon. Mm. Absolutely. Like to thank Looking you. forward to that. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us on the morning show today. Thank you for having thank me. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.